we often tend to think of physical and material things as the ultimate stuff of the universe. And yet, contemporary physics has largely abandoned the physical description of things in favor of energy and fields. And yet, uh, many philosophers have had uh, a belief that materialism is a profound mistake and have challenged a physicalist view of the nature of reality. So should we give up our conviction that physical stuff is the bedrock of the world, or is such stuff just, in the end, unavoidable? Now, I have joining me on this panel to discuss this. Uh, on my immediate right, I have Nancy Cartwright. Nancy Cartwright made very many important contributions on uh, the nature of, of laws, of causation, causal inference, scientific models, the unity of science, and in particular her work in social science, on my immediate left, we have Subira Sacker, who's the head of partic the particle physics group at the University of Oxford and an affiliated professor at the Niels Bohr Institute. Also on my far left, we have John Dupre, who is a philosopher of science and the former president of the British Society for the Philosophy of Science. And he's currently the director of the Center for the Study of Life Sciences at Exeter University. So I'm going to invite each of my panelists to set out their stall in a three minute section and we're really starting with the question of whether we should give up on our conviction that physical stuff is the bedrock of the world. So John could you start us off please? Okay thank you Barry. Um, yeah I I'm, I'm feel slightly, quite strange starting this off because I'm the one person on the panel who doesn't know much about physics um, and I guess to some degree this is a question about physics. Um, so, but I am a philosopher, so I will at least start by, by gesturing towards deconstructing the question. Um, I'm not quite sure what bedrock means in the question. Um, it might just mean that's in some very strange sense all there is, that somehow there's only whatever physicists talk about, whether it's things or stuff. Or it might as often take it to mean something much stronger, that somehow ph whatever physics says there is, um, determines everything else and makes everything else somehow less interesting. Um, I, there, there is a, a lot of discussion among philosophers of science about whether something like the latter is true, but I think we're going to largely avoid that, um, or at least avoid that directly. And so, so then I'm gonna come from a different point and here's my stall. Um, the problem um, I see with talking about things is that at least from my perspective, interest in biology, I don't think there are any things anywhere at any scale. Um, I think what we talk about, th when we talk about things, uh, we're talking about stable parts of processes and the underlying kind of philosophical idea is that much more fundamental than the old question what a thing is, is the question what it does. And actually activity doing um, happening, acting, um, are the, the most fundamental um, constituents of the universe. Um, I, I guess one way of saying that is to have a picture of what the history of the universe is like. Um, the, the universe, I guess, began, and again here this is a question for physicists and cosmologists, but I guess it began pretty much as pure energy or mass energy or something like that. Um, but over the billions of years that have followed, various different things have emerged. I want to see those things um, and, um, as not objects in the traditional sense in which we sort of think of sort of billiard ball atoms and things made up of billiard ball atoms, but as eddies in a flow of process. And I think the eddy in a stream is the perfect kind of paradigm for what actually these things are like. When we understand, when we, when we look at that, a whole lot of things make much more sense from this point of view. As soon as we get start to get any kind of structures out of this evolutionary process, new forms of activity become possible. So even just chunks of matter, an asteroid can dent a planet. That's something that, I guess, pure energy, there's no denting going on there. Um, I'm, of course, uh, I, I guess then we have chemical, um, you know, the evolution of chemical um, objects, things, and what becomes possible then 
is all kinds of interactions which underlay eventually the emergence of life, which is, of course, my particular interest. As we have life and we have living processes, eddies in a stream of immensely complex chemistry structured in various ways, we have countless new activities, things or processes that swim, that can fly, that can mate, that can eat, and so on. And I think we have another stage of this complexity actually with the appearance of humans who do a lot more um, than any other creatures in terms of new kinds of activity that constitute us as humans. Um, and of course, many of those are focused around language, culture, the things we always like to talk about as being very special about ourselves. Um, but, um, but the, you know, and, and I guess, you know, it, as up here, people like us tend to think that rather high up on this um, hierarchy of things we do as debate deep philosophical questions. Um, now, I don't think uh, debating deep philosophical questions at any rate is something that matter does qua matter. Um, it's something that very complex uh, arrays of matter arranged into the kind of dynamic streams that we are um, is capable of, and so far as we know, nothing else has done. This picture, nothing in this picture is supposed to appeal to what might traditionally have been thought of as non-physical stuff. Now, of course, all these complex things that emerge in the evolution of the universe are not physical in the sense of being whatever it is that physics talks about, but, uh, but they're not non-physical in the sense that I take it that all of these things are, insofar as they're made of something, made of whatever physics talks about. The, the whole, the, the, the thrust of what I'm saying is that being made of is not a particularly fundamental or bedrock aspect of something. The fact that we're made of ultimately the same stuff as rocks or giraffes or whatever else um, doesn't tell you anything very much the kinds of activities that we are capable of that make us human are very different. John, thank you. So that's a very broad uh, prospectus. We've got all the way from the eddies in the stream to, uh, I think I, I heard you mention asteroids and planets and all these other things, which might tempt us to think about discrete parts of the stuff. And we'll come back to that, I'm sure. But it, uh, Sabir, let me turn to you with the same question. If we're thinking that um, there's a physical stuff that's the sort of underlying stuff of everything else there is, what is it like? Okay, so I've been to a political debate this morning, so I've learned that you don't answer the question, you tell a story first. <laughs> so, so I'm going to do that by saying a bit apprehensive about appearing on a panel with philosophers, because I'm a physicist, especially since one of my uh, companions here wrote a book called Why the Laws of Physics Lie, which is rather subtle, uh, uh, it puts me in my place. So let me say that I was reminded of a, a story that Helen Dukas, who was Einstein's long-term secretary, uh, she wrote a biography of him. She recounts that she once asked him to come to a talk which was being given on the philosophy of uh, his theory of special relativity. And Einstein sort of hums and haws and says, oh, I'm a bit busy. And, she says, but Herr Einstein, you know, it's on the philosophy of your new theory. Surely you are interested. And he says, you know, when I go to these talks, I feel I'm swallowing something I don't have in my mouth. <laughs> now, I'm sure that's not going to be the case today. <laughs> Let me get Let's just have your other story. <laughs> so, so my response to this question, which is, should we give up on our conviction that the physical stuff is the bedrock of the world? Question mark is to invoke something we call Hinchcliffe's rule in physics. Ian Hinchcliffe is a physicist at Berkeley. And his rule is that if there is a uh, title of a scholarly article is a yes, no question, the answer is always no. Okay. <laughs> now, of course, you can ask, is Hinchcliffe's rule true? Right. So there is a paradox there. <laughs> of course, we all know that Hinchcliffe's rule is uh, true, except when it is not. Right. So it doesn't apply to the three themes of this uh, meeting is, is reality made of matter? Answer is... Uh, we'll get to the, we'll get to the themes. We'll get to the themes. So this question, so. the answer is no. 
The answer is no. So physical stuff is not the bedrock of the world. No, we shouldn't give no, up on it. Oh, we shouldn't, it, give, we up should, we shouldn't it. give up on it. We shouldn't give up on it. Yeah. Good. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.